Hello, and welcome to the Journeys of Folko Hornblower, the One Ring 2nd Edition Strider Mode Adventure. Book 2, Chapter 1. The sound of a rooster crowed in the background as Falco slowly opened his eyes from a deep slumber <sighs> that finally felt restful. The room that he had been staying in at Wood End in Woodhall was fine, but nothing like the finely decorated and comfortable rooms of Bag End, Brandy Hall, or even Farmer Maggot's home in Banfurlong. It suited Falco, however, and the stave was covered by the master of the inn, Odo, so who was to he to complain? Falco stood dressed in his sleepwear and peered out the window, overlooking the main road of Woodhall. Already the woodsmen, farmers, merchants, and other hobbit workers were busy going to and fro about their morning routine, starting the day. Falco took in a deep draw of air and with a sigh said to himself, It's time. He rubbed his shoulder, remembering the events that transpired a little over a month ago. First they attacked at Bucklebarrow Ferry, then at the High Hay in Crick Hollow, and then the Old Forest. Falco looked over towards his clothes, his gear, and walking over, picked up the knife that had been on to Barilak, unsheathed it, and sheathed it back again. Nodding his head, he laid down and proceeded to get ready for the day ahead. Walking down from his guest room and down into the main room of the inn, Odo, standing behind the counter, greeted Falco. Well, good morning, Falco. The usual today? Odo not too worried about the response. Falco's order for breakfast had been the same, and not much chatter between the two occurred since his return to Woodhall. Not today, Odo. I believe I'll take my leave. I'm appreciative of your hospitality these past weeks. I hope it wasn't too much of a burden, Falco said, quietly. Falco walked over to the counter and laid his pack down on the floor, resting his other belongings against the edge of the counter. Falco looked over behind Odo, the axe of Barilak proudly mounted and displayed for all visitors to see. Engraved in the wood it read, Barilak, feller of trees and wicked beasts. Falco looked at Odo. Take care, Odo, and make sure that the axe stays good and true. Odo turned his head and looked over at the axe, then to Falco. It will for as long as I am here, and next to who takes over. Barilak may have been a sour one, but honorable and set of heart he was. Where do you think you're headed to now that this his affairs have been taken care of? Falco grabbed some freshly baked biscuits, wrapped them up in a cloth, and placed it in his pack. I'll wager I'll head up north, to the green fields. Been hearing some hunters have been finding some treasures and some rabbit holes up there. Always wanted to see where old Borlor took, face the goblin horde, after hearing the stories my grandfather would tell me as a young tween. Odo chuckled. Well, it won't be anything like the woody end or the old forest. All you'll be finding there is a rabbit holes and rolling hills of green. But, go. You've been here long enough. I can see you're itching for adventure. You've done proper by Barilak, helping out the town and attending to his affairs. I don't think many who just met him, let alone known him long, would have done the same. It's a testament to your good character, Falco. You'll have a place to stay here any time. With that, Odo extends his hand, Falco reaching out in kind. Thank you, and before I leave the Shire... Whenever that is, I'll come back to say goodbye. Until next time. Falco, grabbing his things, nodded to Odo, and walked towards the inn's rear exit and to the stables. Falco's trusted pony Billy was standing, waiting there as always, in the stables of the fair at Far End. Ever the trusted friend and loyal companion, Billy's time at the stables at Woody End and his time helping Falco move cords of wood over the past couple of weeks seemed to have made Billy grow bigger. His height was the same, but the heavy work and constant supply of feed ensured that Billy's muscles grew larger, and his physique widened. What was once a frugal pony now looked fit and durable. The time Falco and Billy spent hauling wood, pulling up stumps, and moving lo loads of other material to and fro to Woodhull and the surrounding camps strengthened the bond between the two as well. Hand feeding Billy for an early morning meal. Falco set his pack and gear on Billy, secured the load, and led him out behind the inn and into the wood, hoping to reach wood furrows by late evening. The first league crossed the northern tip of the woody end, and after Falco spending quite a bit of time in the forest around Woodhall, didn't pay much attention to the trees as much as he had when he first entered the forest, after leaving Beg End on his way to Banfurlong. Not that he didn't find it pleasant or beautiful, 
but it was starting to look a little too familiar and started to grow a little more like the Chetwood outside of Bree. Comfortable was what came to Falco's mind. The next two or so leagues north were a mi mixture of well-tended farms to wild rolling grasslands, where the occasional deer, rabbit, and other wild game roam free. Falco reached the stock road and looking past, saw the road leading north to Whitfurls. Not that he was shy, but Falco stayed just off the main road and traversed the way over hedges, through the occasional small groves of trees, or weaving his way through the small valleys between the hills. As the evening approached, the lights of the lamps in the thoroughfares of Whitfurls began to glow. Falco turned his way to the road to finish his journey. No need to spook any bounder on patrol, after all. Now that Whitfurls was on the eastern crossroads of the East Road, and the northern road leading to the hills of Scarry, and arguably the industrial centre of the Shire. Like Waymeet in the West Farthing, Whitfurls was the first place all matter of people met to have a tale or two told, drink to quench their thirst, and a place to trade wares. At any given time, passing dwarves travelling to and fro from the Blue Mountains to their kingdoms to the east could be found here, and Falco noticed no different. As Falco entered the main square, scores of hobbit merchants were cleaning up from the day's trade, dwarves securing loads of traded goods on their heavy carts, and a handful of men of Bree were present as well. As the air was warm and the skies clear, tables, chairs and benches were all being dragged out into the square, each inn, tavern and food proprietor getting ready for an evening of food, drink and eventual song. Bounders were out, keeping the peace. Well, Billy, let's get you settled in for the night, and we'll get going in the morrow. Billy nodded in approval after a handful of moments. Falco came upon an inn, seemingly less visited than the others he passed by, and that suited him just fine. The turnip's route was a fine inn by any hobbit standard, even to Wood's End and the Pony, but it definitely didn't match that of the Green Dragon Inn in Bywater. Falco figured the name probably soured visitors to it, but that didn't matter much to Falco. Much quieter this way, he thought. Setting Billy to feed on some nearby grasses, Falco opened the door and then going inside. Greetings and welcome to the turnip's root. How long will you be staying? The innkeeper, a one Mungo grub set, being somewhat surprised by Falco's entry. Just the night, and a place for my pony as well, if that's available, Falco asked, pointing outside. Why, yes, yes, of course. We have a couple of stables out back. Should do it just fine. We have plenty of feed for him. Turnips, in fact. Hopefully he likes turnips. Mungo asked a little too enthusiastically. Not much Billy wouldn't eat. The turnips will do just fine, thank you. May I ask, where's a good place for a weary traveler to eat and have a good drink? First time? I guess second time I've been through here. Falco, now rubbing his forehead and scar, remembering the story Bilda told him of how he was found and he ended up waking up in Bag Inn. Seemed like a lifetime ago, Falco thought. Well, I for one fancy the blue perch, just across the way. Or, if you're really adventurous, the foxhole on the other side of town, near the east. Especially if you're looking to rub elbows with the dwarves. Mungo, moving from behind the counter, pushing Falco outside. But before you go away for the evening, let's get your pony settled and your gear to your room. Oh, forgive my manners. Who should I put the room under, Mr... Falco. Falco Hornblower. Falco, reluctant to say. Mungo nodded his head. Falco... Falco, horn blower. Don't believe I've had a horn blower stay here before. What part of the Shire you hail from, anyway? Mungo said, a little dumbfounded. Oh, uh, I'm not from the Shire. I'm actually from Bree, Bree Hill, to be exact. Falco responded. Mungo's eyes widened a little, and excitement filled his eyes. Most excellent. Hadn't had anyone from Bree come stay here before. I mean, not too many hobbits travel from Bree, at least not for a long time, so I've heard. Almost thought the works of ye end up and left and went somewhere else. Used to come here and trade like the dwarves and men. But been a while. Frankly, don't believe it's been not for two or three generations. Well, either way, thanks for choosing the turnip's route. Mungo, leaning back proudly, giving a nod and a chuckle. Mungo led Billy around back and into one of the two stables there, as Falco unloaded the gear off Billy's back and started to brush his coat. Mungo returned with a basket of large turnips, setting it aside. Well now. That should do your pony, and a fine-looking pony he is. Don't believe I've seen one as strong as that around here. Falco, continuing to brush Billy down. That's because he's a Bree pony. Tough as nails and loyal to a fault, aren't you, my friend? 
Billy nodding and neighing in agreement. Mungo chuckled and waved Falco to bring his belongings inside, following suit. Falco, looking for a little less activity, decided to visit the Blue Perch. By morning, he wished he hadn't. Filled to the brim with hobbits, Falco entered the smoke-filled and noisy room. And as he entered, the maiden from behind the bar yelled out, Say your name or drinks on you! Falco, getting caught a little off guard, shouted, Falco Hornblower! The room went silent. Falco fed every pair of eyes now focused on him. He looked around and everyone stopped what they were doing and was eyeing him from head to toe. Then, without warning, someone in the back yelled out, The Slayer of the Beast! And another responded, The Savior of Buckland! And another, Falco the Wolf Hunter! The room went into a collective uproar and every hobbit near Falco came over and slapped his shoulder, back and chest. The rest stood and shouted, clanking tankards and breaking out into song. All Falco could think was that this was going to be a very, very long night. Falco woke up with the sun shining brightly through an open window on the second floor of the turnip's route. How he got back there he couldn't remember. His head throbbed and ached from the previous night's drinking that dragged on into the wee hours of the morning. It was close to lunch, and Falco wanted to be out of Whitfurrows and on his way to Scary after sunrise. But the residents and visitors at the perch had other plans, as all gathered to sing songs, drink, and tell tales about Falco, Barlack, and the calling of the Black Beast of the Old Forest. It wasn't until the mid-afternoon before Falco was able to make his way on the north road of the, out of Whitfurrows, over the water, and into Budgeford. Falco noticed many names across the small shops and on the posts signaling the laneways of Budgeford. They all referenced the Bulger lineage of Hobbit names. Proceeding along the north road to the east, lush, fertile land stretched north and east beyond the horizon towards what Falco figured was the Brandywine. Few travelers he met on the road north, only the occasional merchant from Dwalling on their way to the markets in Whitfurrows. Their cart laden with quarried stone, iron ingots, and other raw materials to sell or barter. Evening came and Falco found a grove of trees to break for the night and set camp. Billy rested peacefully, grazing in the lush green grasses of the Shire. The evening came and went with no trouble, and what was left of his throbbing headache was no more. The sun rose over the eastern horizon, the rays of light blowing away the thin layer of mist that gathered over the fields of what Falco would later find out as the bridge fields. After a late breakfast, Falco with Billy continued north to Scary. Continuing north and rising far off into the distance, Falco noticed what could only be the range of hills called Scary. And as it rose further and further higher, a few buildings began to come into sight, and the village of Scary was near. By mid afternoon, Falco reached the outskirts of the town, and unlike Whitfurrows, Woodhall, or Buckland, the hobbits that had been out on the road didn't pay heed to Falco or Billy. After a few unanswered hellos and good day to see you, sir, to passing hobbits of Scary, Falco quickly realized these weren't the most welcoming of folk. Hard at work they were, and as far as Falco could tell, not too worried about their look. Most wore dusty and dirt-stained clothes, hair unkept, and faces that could have done with a slight wash, covered in what looked like dirt and smoke dust. Getting to the center of town, Falco spotted what looked like a watering hole, a place called Sour Grapes. I think we best get a quick bite and drink and move past this place, Billy. These folks don't seem to take to strangers well. One what has them in such a dour mood. Falco tying Billy to the railing just outside the pub entranceway. Opening the door, a small bell rings, and unlike the perch and Whitfurrows, no one cared to check who entered. Falco didn't mind this after what happened two nights before. Walking over to the patron, Falco went to speak, but was quickly interrupted. Best be quick with it. Everyone here is busy, least of which is me. So what will you have? Taken aback a little, Falco responded. Uh, whatever is pouring and whatever is cooked, the hobbit responded. Fine, sit over there, and pointed to Falco at a small table in the far corner. The meal wasn't anything to write home about, but not bad either. And the drink was a bland tasting wine that did the trick. But that was it. Sour grapes indeed. But by the looks of the hobbits of Scary, they were. They really didn't care. Falco quietly sat and eavesdropped on a number of the conversations happening. 
Nothing I heard about the happenings in the south, more of what's been happening around the hills was scary. One in particular piqued his interest. An older hobbit came in and spoke about the mines that, out of the Brockenbores, the village to the west of Scary. So, did you hear about the Griffo Headstrong over at Brockenbores? Been sick for days, can't get rid of it, whatever he caught. I mean, I know it ain't the cleanest of work, but we've been mining these hills for years, and nothing like this fell upon anyone. That's the fourth bloke in a fortnight coming downhill. I don't like it one bit. Believe I'm going to talk with the mine boss in the morrow and ask what we should do before going down to the mines here and scary. I mean, I've got mouths to feed. I can't afford to be laid up in bed. Another spoke up in response. Well, I hear that someone found an old goblin skull on one of the shafts that opened up. Sure, it was only a few weeks ago they dug out that new vein, and then all of a sudden people start dropping like flies off the kitchen window. From the bar, a hobbit turned around. Hey, come on. This says that old gum thimble, you know, the goblin chief that bull roar clean smacked his head off. You know, that golf was started. That just before he was headless, he cursed the shire and would exact his revenge. Aye, maybe this is it. The barkeep clanked down on some tankards and put his hands on the counter. Ah, grow up, the laddie. I've gone off your rockers. Those young lads they got now mining up there in Brocken Bars. They're just playing old up and lazy. Never seen a hard day's work. Just looking for time off. Pfft. Cursed stories. Hobbits dropping like flies. Where do you come up with these things? Falco experienced enough already in a short time in the Shire that things aren't always as they appeared. And maybe there was something to this malality that has been following the Brocken Boars. Standing up and paying for the meal, Falco asked the keeper of the bar, How does one get over to Hardbottle? Take it you haven't been around here before. Well, you're too clean for one. That's an obvious sign, the hobbit giving Falco the look over. Head west to the Brocken Boars and continue on and tell you, you another road. You'll see it going north. That'll take you to Dwalling, and past that is Hardbottle. Now, if you're finished eating and paying, best be off. Can't have too many loiterers. Then all sorts of people will just stay here. Grumbled the barkeep, turning abruptly, going about his business. Falco nodded his head and walked out the front door. Billy stood waiting like a sentry on guard. To the Brocken Boars, Billy. We'll hold up there for the night. But before Falco could untie and lead Billy to the road leading west, Falco hadn't realized that the sunny day now turned dark, and with heavy, dark grey clouds having rolled in from the west, and the rain started to pour. I believe our welcome is overstayed here, Billy. Otherwise, I'd look for an inn. But I think we'd have best a more comfortable verse outside of town than in it. Let's see how far we'll get. The road from Scary to Brockenbores was rough, to say the least. The rain sure didn't help. The huge ruts which had been created by ore and stone-laden carts from the mines filled with muddy water, and traversing the road was a laborious ordeal. As the light waned, Falco stopped and found what he could for shelter, which wasn't much. A cold and wet evening it was, and by morning both he and Billy were soaked almost to the bone. Fortunately, the morning sun rose as it did the previous days, warm and bright, blowing whatever mist or fog was blanketing the hills to the north and the grassland and pastures to the south. Falco could see way off into the distance what he wagered was Brockenbores. Similar to Scary, what smiles there were, the above-ground buildings and the large structures towards the hills all seemed to be in the same state, dusty, dirty, and sooty. A blackened, grey smoke rose from the number of buildings off in the far hills, Falco thinking they must be the foundries and smithies working the mine, or into a usable iron for making all manners of metal objects. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a loud, heavy-sounding bell rang out throughout the valley, and the town was built in. Falco noticed now hobbits of all sizes rushed out of buildings, dropped whatever it was they were doing, and ran as fast as they could to what Falco could only think was the mines. Falco followed suit. Reaching the entrance to the mine, and over the sounding of the mine bell tower, shouts and calls from inside the entrance to the mine tunnel could be heard. Cries from the women sounded all over the gathered onlookers. Children huddled and hung to their mothers. Falco overheard whispers. Not another. Hope it's not faster. Someone needs to shut this place down before it's too late. On and on the rumblings of the gathered hobbits continued. Then out of the shadows of the tunnel came a score of hobbits, a handful pulling a cart. From where Falco was standing, he could see the unmistakable sign of hobbit feet, just a pair of dangling from the rear. Oh no, it's Fastrid! cried out one of the hobbit women. Another, who had accompanied her, 
This mine should have been closed down weeks ago with the first. What's wrong with you? The hobbit lady now pointing at a group of well-to-do hobbits standing, papers and smoking pipes in hand. The group of well-to-doers turned to each other, and after a few moments, one of them spoke up loudly to the gathered group of hobbits and hobbit miners. We're shutting down the mine now until we figure out what is going on. Please, go home, and we'll take care of it, and we'll let you know what we find out. The gathered hobbits and miners alike, almost all in unison. It's about time! Finally, you dwellings get it. What good that it does the poor fellow in that cart. Should have been closed weeks ago. Off they all shuffled now. Some continued to shout, others sobbing and crying, others just in solemn contemplation. The handful of what I could only think was the mine administrators, gathered around slowly, proceeded to go towards the mine entrance. Workers from within and around the mine started to pick up their tools and belongings, setting aside wagons, underground gear, and the like. The yard virtually now empty, Falco walked up towards the standing group of hobbits. What seems to be the trouble? Falco interjected, the hobbits as they spoke to one another. Coughing, a one Erling Goldworthy turned to Falco, brow raised. I can see you're not from around here, for you know what was happening. The others, in unison, turned to face Falco, and Goldworthy continued. Well, you see, the workers seem to be convinced this mine is cursed, causing a grave sickness. I call gobbledygook, and just an excuse to get off work. But, this being the fifth poor unfortunate soul that's come out of the mine in this past month, so I cannot, in all good conscience, send in another young lad, lest we cause a revolt and the townsfolk burn the whole place down. Goldworthy, eyes Falco up and down, and Billy behind him. I see you're not of the gardening folk. Bit of a hunter, I wager, by that bow of yours. And a well-seasoned pony by the looks of it. I'd almost wager you're one of the Reland hobbits. Falco nodded in agreement. Well then, how's about we come to an agreement? Something of a mutual benefit for you and for us. Falco paused, taking a deep breath. And not that he wanted to do anything. Dangerous. Still found himself answering. What did you have in mind? The hobbits gathered in the head office of the mine master. And after some tea, some smoking of pipes, and animated discussions amongst everyone, Falco, led by Goldworthy, exited the building and out into the main grounds of the mine. Well, Mr. Hornblower, if the story is true, then you're the right hobbit for the job. Besides, not sure I'd find anyone from here to Scary or even to Quarry to go down into those tunnels now. I'll make sure your pay is ready when you come back out. When do you plan on going in? Falco responded, In the morning. And bid Goldworthy a farewell, and we'll see him when he returned from his investigations. Falco was given keys to a boarding room on the mine grounds, and a place to tie Billy up for the evening, and during his time dwelling into the in the tunnels. Falco retired for the evening, and although he rested, he tossed and turned, staring at the ceiling for most of the time. He whispered to himself, What have you gotten yourself into now, Falco? Book 2, Chapter 2 The sun barely rose over the hills of Scarry when Falco woke up and looking out the window, a slight fog blanketed the village of Brockenbors, making the area look all too eerie. Falco stretched, then gathered his belongings, and prepared a sizable breakfast for the morning. He walked out of the small boarding house he had been given for the night, dressed as he would for any hunt into the Chetwood. This would be a first, however, going far underground, into a mine, and again he questioned what he was doing, a tinge of regret came over him. But as the fog was being burnt off by the warm summer sun, and he panned over the mine site and the village proper, he knew something must be done to find out what was going on and get these people's lives back to some sense of normalcy. That, and he agreed to the work and reward he would receive when he came back. Finishing breakfast and walking outside, he saw Billy. Walking over and cutting a handful of grasses with Barilak's knife, he hand-fed him and brushed his mane, head, and neck. Billy, I'm going to have to do this one alone. Don't believe you'll take kindly to the mines. Besides, these are hobbit mines, and not sure you'll quite fit well. Falco paused, took in a deep breath of air, and continued. Now listen, listen to me good. If I'm not back out of this mine in a day or two, you head back to home, to Bree. You know the way, don't you, boy? 
Billy nodded and neighed in agreement. After another few moments, Falco gave Billy a head nod and bid him farewell and proceeded, spear, bow, and pack in hand. What would normally be a noisy, active place now was eagerly silent. Only the footstep of Falco's bare feet walking on the dirt path to the mine entrance echoed throughout. Suddenly, from behind an old shed, Falco heard a whisper. Psst! Over here! Over here! Falco turned and two, what would be unmistakably hobbit miners, waved to Falco to come over. The pair of hobbits were definitely not the most refined, clothes dirty and dusted from many days of underground work. Falco noted that they were nervous as well and somewhat scared of something. One of them was constantly peering from around the corner, looking back and forth, almost as if waiting for something. The other continued to wave Falco towards. Come on, come on, we haven't got all day. Falco tried what he could to garner if they were friend or foe, but considering the circumstances, he had no choice but to trust them, and it didn't look to hinder Falco's task so far. Look, it's a great thing you're going down and, and checking the mines out, but we came to warn you, warn you about what's down there. The hobbit now looking more nervous, peering behind him, behind Falco, side to side. Falco rested his spear and nodded for the hobbit to continue. Well, you see, my partner and I have been down in the eastern mines most of our working lives, you know. So we know what's down there. Not much just a bunch of crabby miners, rock, and that iron we bring out every day. Honest day's work. Well, one day, we's been opening up a new tunnel. Old Goldworthy is wanting more and more iron brought out, right? So here, we and my partner behind me, just chipping away at the rock, and then all of a sudden we break some into something. Darkness, I tell you. Pure darkness. Barely the light of the lamps broke through it. The air was cold, damp, and it reeked of something out of the deepest pits. Oh, we ran, we did. We ran as fast as we could. Dreadful experience it was. The hobbit paused, shook his head, and took in a breath, continuing. Well now, we goes and talks to old Goldworthy about what we saw and what happened. Said he'll take care of it. He told us not to tell anyone, so we hadn't, until now, telling you. You see... That's when all this started, all this fuss here in the mines. First it was Dudo, who came ill. Then it was Isambold and Marmadas, who suffered those terrible leg injuries. And then Pasco, the coughing spats he had. We can hear them through the north, south, and east mines. Then now poor Fastrit. Found him, they did, dead, somewhere in the north. Suddenly, the other hobbit on lookout interrupted. Marek, let's get! Gold wordy is coming! With that, the two rushed behind the building and out of sight. Falco turned and walked out into the center of the main path leading to the mine, and stopping, turned around to see Goldworthy, alone, walking towards him. Ah, Mr. Hornblower, glad to have caught you before you headed in. I was hoping you hadn't left yet. Glad that you hadn't. Wanted to give you a brief overview of the mines. Goldworthy gave a rundown on the mines, the north, south, and eastern tunnels. The east being the oldest, the north newest to be open, with new tunnels in each section being opened up all the time. Who knows which tunnels have opened up something we shouldn't have. The main entrance should have supplies available for you to take on your investigation. Picks, lanterns, rope, that sort of thing. So take whatever you think you need. The mines have been in use for some time, so they're quite extensive. Pack yourself some forbiddens. You may be down there a while. If you haven't returned by evening, I'll send in a crew to come and find you. If any are willing to go in, of course. Best of luck, and thank you for your service. And with that, Goldworthy turned around, pipe in his mouth and one hand behind his back, walked slowly back towards the mine offices. Like most Hobbit architecture, the mine entrance was much the same. A large, round, heavy wooden door, iron bracing, hinges and supports, looked much more of the same elegance of any smile main door in the Shire. The door didn't seem all that out of place to the rest of the hill either carefully and meticulously built to blend into the hillside of the grass. The large door was closed with a warning for none to enter unless on official business. Pulling on the large iron rings, Falco braced and pulled with all of his might, but none was needed. Perfectly balanced the door had been, and with surprisingly very little effort, Falco was able to open it, as if one was opening a pantry door. The light of the morning shone through into the large dome staging area for the mine. Cabinets, tables, and racks for holding gear, jackets, and the like were all along the walls. The area was lit with large, oil-burning lamps, and off to what Falco thought was the north, south, and east directions were large tunnels 
into the darkness of the underground. Falco went to one of the cabinets, opened one, and found what he wanted. A coil of rope, lantern, and some oil. Falco stood and looked at each of the tunnels. Well, Falco, this is it. Better hop to it, no time to waste, he said to himself. Lantern in one hand, spear in the other, bow at the ready across his back. Falco first started with the north tunnels, where the unfortunate Fastrid was found lifeless. Unlike the large staging area, the tunnels were much smaller, larger than the halls in Bag End or Brandy Hall, mind you, but small enough that only two or three hobbits, maybe two dwarves, could easily fit through. Anyone larger than a dwarf would have to almost crawl to get through, as the ceiling height hasn't that much taller than Falco's spear. Falco was unsure of the time he spent so far exploring the northern mines, but checking the lantern he noticed he burned through a third of the oil. He hadn't noticed much out of place in the maze of excavated tunnels. Entering what looked to be a new section of the mine, he stopped for a quick rest, a bite from some biscuits and dried meat he had taken along, and dimmed the lantern to conserve on its fuel. Out of the corner of his eye, down the long tunnel of this newly worked rock, he noticed a slight green-bluish light emanating from down the way. He hadn't noticed it until now, until after dimming the lantern. Falco paused to listen, no sound he had heard. Finishing up his snack, he turned the lamp up just enough to see a little better, but still keeping the green-blue light visible. Holding his spear at the ready, the lantern in the other hand, he carefully and quietly proceeded down the tunnel. He wasn't far down from where he had rested before the tunnel opened up into a massive, naturally made cavern, damp and fairly warm as compared to the rest of the tunnel so far. Falco set down the lantern behind him, and with his body blocking the lamplight, the cavern glowed the green light all around. On the floor and along the lower halls of the cavern, Falco could see what appeared to be half circular shaped globs all around. Turning and grabbing the lantern, he turned up the light and now could see more easily what those globs were. Mushrooms thrived here, it seems, and were of a variety unfamiliar to Falco, and he's quite sure unfamiliar to most hobbits. Falco, not proceeding any further, decided to step back. He stepped back and unfortunately his foot brushed up against a smaller mushroom near him, and in doing so a small puff of what Falco could only think were spores spewed out. Falco quickly started to cough, not severely, but enough that he quickly covered his mouth and ran back down to the relative safety of the mine tunnel. Falco coughed, spit, and rinsed his mouth out with some fresh water from his water skin. As he was securing the water skin in his pack, Falco noticed what looked like an eaten stem of a mushroom on the tunnel floor. Hmm, looks eaten. I'd say that poor hobbit tried to eat one of those. Hmm, I was always told not to eat a mushroom. You weren't sure what it was. Guess someone never told Old Faster that, Falco said under his breath. He proceeded back to the shaft entrance, and as best he could, with his spear hand, engraved on the tunnel wall, Danger, do not enter. But the mushrooms didn't explain all of what happened that the two informants had told Falco earlier that day, and really didn't seem to fit the description they had of the tunnel and cavern they opened up as well. Although Falco felt sickly, and the mushrooms seemed really out of place, he didn't sense the dread nor darkness the two had said they had felt. Falco proceeded through the northern mines and seemed to have entered another different section. One he could only think of was the eastern set of tunnels of the mine, as the rock looked to have been chipped and chiseled at an earlier time of the mine. Proceeding again through the labyrinth of tunnels similar in size and feel as the northern ones, Falco turned around the corner into a larger, longer, and straighter tunnel, often to the distance and the light of the day shone. Walking down, he found himself in the main staging area of the mine. It was just past midday, and Falco, finding not a better time than now, sat and had a lunch and replenished the fuel for his lantern. A slight nudging in his mind told him to grab a torch, and he listened. Who knows how long he'll be down here and having a second source of light wouldn't be a bad thing. Falco now entered into the southern mines, and like the northern and eastern tunnels so far, the look and feel were much the same. He proceeded through the network of tunnels until coming into what he had thought again was the eastern tunnels, however in a different location than he had entered from on the north side. This section looked to be newer in excavation, and he proceeded down what Falco thought was a much more recent tunnel. As he proceeded, small excavations were on either side, but not very deep. And he continued, continued straight down, and as he approached a bend in the tunnel, an intense feeling of darkness and dread washed over him. 
The rock was a darker, shadowy color, he noted, and even the light from the lamp seemed duller, less vibrant. The shadows cast by the lantern light seemed longer and almost as if they had moved ever so slightly, eerily. Falco chalked it up to his mind playing tricks. He clenched his hand around the spear, however, just a little bit harder, and walked on, shaking off the feeling of dread as his spirits and moved forward. Walking ever so silently, his years under the tutelage of his grandfather as they hunted in the forest of the Chetwood coming to great use, Falco dimmed his lantern like just enough to see shapes and the outlines of the opening at the far end of the cavern. Falco laid the lamp down and clutched the spear with both his hands and inched his way forward, his eyes now adjusting to the diminished light. He could see a little further into the darkness. The tunnel opened up to a large dome cavern. Stalagmites rose from the floor, stalactites similarly reaching down from above. The faint dripping of water echoed throughout, and besides the shallow breathing of Falco, nothing else could be heard. Falco quietly moved and picked up the lantern to shed more light within the cavern. To the far end, directly across, Falco could see another large opening that remained dark, but Falco couldn't see what was beyond. To the right and left, Falco could see somewhat into other openings, each seemingly opening up into another separate cavern-like chambers. Falco proceeded to the left side first, setting the lamp just outside the entrance of this opening, the light exposing more of the inside. Falco's eyes widened to what he had saw and as he stepped just into the opening littered on the floor of the chamber was countless bones of various sizes and shapes, skulls of various creatures, leg bones, rib cages all strewn throughout. Covering it all was a thickened web-like strands crisscrossing all over the chamber, Falco being all too careful not to touch. Falco then felt another wave of dread wash over him, not wanting but forcing himself, he looked up. The lamp light wasn't enough to fully expose what he saw, but just enough to get the size, the shape, and the outline of what it was. This nameless thing was larger and more terrifying a thing he'd ever seen, not even as wild as nightmares or scariest of stories he'd heard could describe it. Even the savage, ravenous, wolf-like beasts of the old forest had not compared. Eight large and long legs protruded from the center of a large, bulbous body, wrapped around a large, central stalactite. A large round sack-like protrusion made up its end. A duo of long, thick, protruding fangs fell from what Falco could only think with its mouth, dangling freely from its body. The creature was large, larger than some of the buildings he's encountered in the Shire, but an, but an encouraging thought crossed his mind. There's no way that thing could fit into the mines proper. Falco also realized the creature was seemingly asleep and unaware of its presence. Fortune seemed to favor Falco this day. Not wanting to spend any more time than he than he had to, he carefully and ever so quietly, ensuring not to step on anything to make a sound, inched his way back into the main cavern. What was this creature? He's not sure anyone knows, but one thing was for sure, this tunnel must be sealed off and never to be opened again. Falco's curiosity did, however, stop him from returning and heading back to the surface. He wondered what was in the other chamber opposite the creature's lair. Falco looked, and to his amazement, large, cocooned, with a web-like substance, were large, elongated structures attached to the stalagmites on the chamber floor, or dangling from the stalactites from the ceiling. Falco took out his knife and cut into one of them. The web-like structure was dry and firm to cut, but the knife was sharp and made easy work of it. Ripping it open, Falco came face to face with a half-preserved but long-dead goblin. He opened another, this time a man, the next an orc. The horrid creature seemed to not care for what it ate, as long as it ate. One thing it didn't seem to care for was things made of metal, precious metals or the like. Littered throughout were coins, precious stones, some rusty swords, daggers and spears, and half wrought up bows. What is this? Falco whispered. Something caught his eye. And just with the flickering of the lamplight behind, Falco noticed a glimmer under one of the hanging cocoon sacks. Carefully making his way over, he spotted and picked up a ring, a very fine ring, made of what appeared to be a silvery-like metal. He couldn't pick out the markings on the ring, there just wasn't enough light, but he could feel for them. Without thought or warning, he put it on, and suddenly a wave of darkness came over him, as if the shadows cast from the light of the lantern and the darkness in the cavern chamber reached out and pulled at his heart and his very soul. 
Falco took a step back and tried to shake off the dreariness that had befallen him, but he seemed not to be able to. He took off the ring, however the darkness remained within him. He put it back on and whatever the effect, it seemed not to get any worse. Either way, it was a very nice ring he had thought, for why wouldn't he keep it? Better he to have it than the creature in the other chamber. Not wanting to tarry any longer, he was able to pocket a number of small gems, some of the coins with him, securing them in his pack, careful to not make any noise. He proceeded back into the east tunnels. The quiet of the tunnels which he had experienced so far was broken by the hurried clanking of metal and rock. He pondered what could be happening. Had he spent that much time in the mines, and Goldworthy now had sent in a search party? What was couldn't have been further from the truth. Rounding the corner of the tunnel was Goldworthy himself, pick in hand, hurriedly chipping and digging into the sports of the tunnel walls and ceiling. Falco stopped and shouted, Goldworthy! Goldworthy stopped and looked to see Falco. I'm sorry. It must be done. And with that, he swung the pick against the wood support, causing it to buckle and give way to the weight of the surrounding rock. Falco yelled, No! As the walls of the tunnel started to give away, and suddenly between both Goldworthy and Falco, the ceiling caved in and closed off the tunnel. The resulting wave of debris and dust blew out the lantern. The noise of the falling rock echoed, and the floor, walls, and ceiling all shuddered from the collapse. Falco relit the lantern, and looking at the pile now before him, he slowly turned back towards the chamber with the nameless thing, and realized his way out was somewhere that way. Figuring time was not on his side, and the resulting collapse surely would have woken up the creature, he sprinted as fast as he could towards the chamber and to the other side he had not yet explored. Hopefully his instincts were right, and that it was a path to out to the surface, somewhere, but he couldn't be for sure. He also was sure he couldn't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with that beast, so it was a chance he was willing to take to head down into the dark unknown. As he entered the chamber, just as he made it to the middle of the chamber, the creature crawled out from its lair and onto the ceiling between the stalactites to block the way to the other side. Foco's spear, already at the ready, threw it in an attempt to hinder the creature, but it harmlessly bounced off its bulbless body and down, bouncing on the cavern floor. Falco ran towards the far side and, readying his bow and knocking an arrow, aimed as best as he could on the run and let release the arrow, struck true to the arrow it did, seemingly hindering the movement of one of the creature's front legs. Falco took the slight opportunity, rolled and bolted under its large frame and proceeded towards the far entrance into the darkened tunnel. The creature with one of its forward two legs reached out to grab at Falco. One struck true. A sharp, stabbing pain now radiated through Falco's left shoulder blade. Falco crying out in pain. Fortunately, his toughened leather shirt held true, otherwise the strike would have resulted in a deep puncture wound, if not worse. The second leg tried to wrap around Falco. However, the arrow, which he had shot just a moment before, hindered the creature's ability to grasp at Falco, and he was able to break away without much effort, escaping into the tunnel. For whatever reason, the creature didn't follow and Falco wasn't going to question why. He ran as fast and as far as he could before the oil of the lamp started to dim and flicker, signaling the oil was almost out. Falco quickly looked for a smooth place to rest, finding a spot behind a large outcropping. As he sat, the last of the oil burned out, and the light from the wick slowly faded and darkness overcame the lone hobbit. It was the darkest of dark that Falco now found himself. Cold, damp, the underground air now chilling through his bones. As he slowly succumbed to the fatigue of the day's events, he wondered how Billy, his trusted pony, was faring, and if he was faring better than he was. Book 2, Chapter 3 Part 1 Falco awoke, alone in the complete darkness of the tunnel he found himself now currently in. He wasn't quite sure if he was awake, but he noticed that even the darkness didn't seem as dark as the shadows in his most recent dreams throughout the night. At no time before in his dreams had he had experienced such darkness, a darkness that had somehow enveloped deep into his mind. He felt his hands and then felt for the ring he had found earlier in the lair of that nameless thing. 
what foul curse now lay upon him, Falco didn't know. He grabbed his pack and felt inside for some of his provisions and for the torch, which fortunately he had the wherewithal to take despite having the once working lantern full of oil. He figured it best to save as much of the torch as possible and would only light it when absolutely necessary and try and make his way down the tunnel by feeling his way by hand against the walls and feeling with the tip of his spear on the floor ahead. Hopefully, he thought, he'd reach the surface before he became too wary to continue and spend another sleep in the darkness of the underground. Finishing a quick bite, Falco proceeded down the tunnel, feeling the sides of the rocky walls and floor, and shuffling his feet ever so carefully. Foot by foot, he carefully, and at a snail's pace, proceeded down the tunnel. And no light he saw either ahead of him or behind, nor heard no sound, save for the shuffling of his bare feet, the occasional kicking of a small rock, or his own breathing. He thought it very fortunate that no creature of the dark has found him yet. Hours had passed, and Falco felt the wall he'd been following suddenly stopped, and followed in a different direction away from him. The sound of a rock which he had just kicked echoed throughout the walls of what Falco could only think was a cavern. Then, his mind briefly thought of the nameless thing perched up on the ceiling, waiting to pierce him with its unnaturally long and gruesome fangs. His shoulder throbbed and the ring he had found, now on his left index finger, seemed to be tighter on the thought of the creature. But when he breathed in and shook off the image, the ring relaxed and felt normal again. Feeling for the torch on his pack and pulling the flint and steel from one of the pockets, Falco proceeded to light the torch. The torch quickly sparked and erupted in a bright orange-red flame, the intense light within the once darkened cavern forcing Falco to swing his head away, eyes paining from the sudden outburst of light. His eyes, which had adjusted for the deep darkness, took a while for them to acclimate well enough for him to fully open his eyes and see what lay before him. The light and warmth from the torch was soothing to Falco's soul, and he spent a few moments savoring the feeling. But then he quickly realized, however, he could waste no time, as although the torch burned as bright as the lantern, it for sure wouldn't last as long in doing so. Looking around the now-lit chamber, he smiled, as he saw no creature from the ceiling or along the walls or the floor which descended all around into a deep depression into the floor of the rock. Murky water gathered and Falco figured that he was at least a little closer to the surface, for where could the water have come from? Off to the side, Falco saw another tunnel, a small flow of water dripping off the edge and into the pool. Falco, having made a number of twists and turns, and not having experienced spelunking in the darkness of the underground, had no idea which direction of where he was headed, whether it be further into the Shire or out of it. The ledge jutting out of the walls and above the pool in water wasn't too big, but just big enough that he was able to back himself against the side walls and shuffle his way around to the far, newly found tunnel. Another wave of dread came across his chest, nothing major, just a feeling of fear and wariness about what, if anything, lurked in the water below. Mustering some inner courage, he made his way to the other tunnel, and after a short while since following the passage, Falco doused the torch. Hopefully it'll light again, he thought. Hours now have passed since he traversed the open cavern and into the new tunnel, and Falco spotted an encouraging sight. Often to the unknown distance, the faintest spot of light Falco saw, and a smile came across his face. As he stopped to look, he felt the faint brush of fresh air come across him, a most encouraging moment. Glad Falco was that he was nearer to the surface, and he quickly lit the torch, and after waiting for his eyes to adjust again, he proceeded towards the light, quickening his pace. The torch, as Falco had previously thought, flickered out, and shortly after he lit it, but fortunately for Falco, he was near what he had hoped was the surface of the outside. The light, fortunately for Falco, was coming from the surface, and with a small climb up the wall of rock, he was free of the darkness and the cold air of the underground, and into the open, fresh air of the surface. But Falco found himself in a heavy fog, however, and although he was out of the darkness, he was only able to see a number of feet ahead of him. The hole in the underground was large, large enough for the nameless creature to enter, but as he stepped away, and with the lay of the land and how the rock around it had settled, it was quite hidden. He wagered one could only see if the opening, only if you were basically standing next to it. Falco wondered how, and it would seem not plausible, the creature made it appear so, in some unnatural way. The day was as bright as one could expect with the heavy fog, and Falco figured he could use a rest and a bite to eat over a warm fire. And so he set himself a fair distance away, 
a small fire. He spent a fair bit of time on putting into memory the location, for he thought someone, if not himself, could venture back in the rid the place of the terror that lurked within. He was definitely in no shape, nor could one, especially a hobbit, fell such a horrid creature by themselves. Was there such a being that could? Falco questioned to himself. Letting the small fire die out, he cleaned up as best he could, when, again, fortune it would seem, favored Falco as the wind started to blow from the west and the fog started to dissipate. The land he saw was a mix of rolling, rocky hills bare of any trees, with only the occasional bush, as tall as a hobbit, dotting the landscape. This was definitely not the Shire, and Falco wagered he was east of the Brandywine and somewhere north of the Great Road. But he, of course, could not know for sure. Billy came across his mind, for he wished his trusted companion was along with him. And then he remembered. Bree! I must get to Bree. Hopefully you found your way safely, my good friend. Falco said aloud, then realized he was talking to himself. Smiling, he shook his head, and finding his bearings, proceeded on course eastward towards what he thought would be the greenway between Bree to the south and Fornos to the north. Off he went, feet to the march, to the east. Three days had passed since leaving the darkness of the underground before Falco reached sight of the road, passing by countless stone and grass-covered hills. Roaming wild sheep, deer, and other fauna, stretches of colorful wildflowers and the occasional patch of brush and stunted trees. Falco always heard this land was uncivilized, and if one were to fall ill or otherwise, for sure they would die alone, with no one to help. Falco was careful to keep an eye out for danger, and ensured he kept watch on his meager provisions, lest he run out and couldn't forage or hunt for food. He stopped where he could safely tuck himself behind some cover, or where he found some fresh water from a small brook, or when he happened on a fresh set of tracks from wild game. Despite the stops, he kept up an unusually fast pace, his heart set on reaching Bree as fast as he could, in hopes his trusted pony was there waiting for him. Cresting on a taller hill to get a better view of the far horizon to the east, Falco smiled with a sense of relief. There, he saw, but a twenty-minute walk away, the road, which he assured himself was the north section of the Greenway. With excitement, he hurried off down the other side, off the rocky outcropped hill and towards the road. Help! Help! Please help! Falco heard a cry come from just over the way, a female voice. Falco stopped and looked around. Just over a small ridge to the north of where he stood, a woman was running, waving towards Falco, but then suddenly tripped on an unseen rock and tumbled head over heels down the small hill. Falco gasped and, taking no warning, ran as quickly as he could muster to assist the fallen lady. The woman was a young and being of Bree and not of the Shire, he was quite sure that she was just shy above twenty in years. She wore a dress mild in color, made of a heavy linen common for the folk in the wildlands, and Falco wagered she and her family were trying to etch out a life here in the wilderness. As he approached, he heard her moan and groan as she started to gather her strength and get to her feet. Oh, I am so happy to lay eyes on someone. I've been lost for what seems like days, the lady said with a sigh of relief but with a hint of pain experienced from the fall and rolled down the small hill she came over. I've been wandering these hills trying to find my home, my family. A visible sign of distress came over her as she looked around. I was sure it was just over this hill. How did you find yourself here? Are there others with you? Falco now ushering to her to sit down and take a rest on a nearby rock. No, no, there's no one else here but me. No, I... I... She started to rub her head and continued. I was out chasing one of her calves who broke free of her fences. But... But it was very foggy, you see, and as much as I was careful, I tripped up and hit my head. She took in a deep breath and continued again. When I woke up, it was after dusk and the fog was still blanketing everything, and I had no idea where I was. So I started to walk where I thought my family's farm is, and, well, that was... I think... I don't know how long ago. Do you know where I am? Her eyes turned soft and fragile, almost to the brink of tears. Falco realized there was some strength of spirit in her, as most who live outside the safety of the Shire or the hedge of the Bree are tough and hardy folk. Falco remembered how not long ago he found himself in a similar fate, falling, rolling down a hill, and hitting his head on a rock. Only through the grace and luck of a passing traveler had he been spared. Well, my lady, I'm not completely sure where I, or we are. I've recently found myself in a similar predicament, so I can't in good conscience not lend a hand and get you home. 
Falco stood back and pointed towards the east. Now, there is a road that I see just before meeting you, just over a couple of hills here to the east, which I'm hoping is the Greenway. Is your farmstead not far from the road? The woman stood, catching herself as she momentarily lost her balance, and then brushed herself off. Yes, yes, it's not far from the road. I'll know exactly where I am when you get me there. Falco clapping his hands and started to move forward. Come now, let's get you home. Falco was surprised that she was able to keep up. What with her head injury and the recent tumble. Strong women indeed, the ones living in the wildlands, Falco thought. They crested to the top of the last hill, with the road now clearly visible just up ahead. Falco looked around and in the distance spotted a building, and another larger building, seemingly to Falco's at least some sort of barn. Pointing, is that your farm? The daily looked, and in excitement, yes, yes it is, come, come, I'll lead the way, thank you, oh, thank you. Off she bolted down the hill, Falco cried for her to slow down, but to no avail. Whatever the strength she had, she was using it now, he thought, and he followed. As they reached the outer fence of the farmstead, Falco felt something was amiss. There were no animals about, as far as he could tell, and the pasture hadn't seemed to be, have been grazed by any beast for some time. Off he continued to follow the lady, as she darted past the house and around the far side. Wait, lady, wait! Something's not right! You could be a... Falco, now seeing what danger was afoot, but it was not the lady who was in danger, but it was himself. A wave of regret came over him. Why was he so foolish out here in the wild open? He should have known southerners roam these lands as of late, always up to no good. Falco readied his spear and lifted his bow from across his back and readied in his offhand. Then, out from the other edge of the farmhouse, darted a man, a southerner by the looks of him, tall, burly, scraggly beard with the dirtied and torn clothes. He carried with him a short spear in one hand and a large axe in the other, and upon seeing Falco rushed around the corner, throwing it towards him with a shoulder-like position. Falco reacted in kind, his aim true like a seasoned predator striking true to its intended prey. Falco's spear hit hard and deep into the chest wall of the southerner, opening a long and large gaping gash across, blood now soaking the dirty tattered cloth, cloth wrapped he was wearing. The spear hit Falco with a resounding thud, the weight of the spear and the speed at which the southerner threw it adding to the impact. Falco cried out in pain, but the armor that had handed down to him by his grandfather held true, and unlike the southerner, the spearhead didn't pierce nor cut him. Falco readied his bow and knocked an arrow, and as he ran back toward the far side of the home to gain some immediate cover, he took what aim he could, and the man, now brandishing his axe, charged towards him. Falco's aim wasn't as fortunate as before, as the arrow harmlessly shot off into the distance. The southerner closed the distance, and with a heavy swing, he hit the side of the outer wall of the house, wood splintering from the impact. Falco was thankful he wasn't as tall as a man or elf, even a dwarf, for he surely would have been cleaved in two, he quickly thought. All of a sudden, from out of the other side of the house was the woman, now brandishing a spear herself, charged and struck dead center into Falco's mid-abdomen, just between the belt of his trousers and the bottom-hardened leather cuff of his shirt. The spearhead pierced deep into his stomach. Blood spewed out, and an intense wave of pain came over Falco. He garnered what strength he had left and rolled away behind the two southern attackers, and standing up, bow still in his hand, knocked another arrow, and aimed as best he could. But as he pulled back, the pain was too sharp and unbearable, and crouching in pain, the arrow flew harmlessly up and over the house. The man with the axe lunged forward toward him, and with both hands came down hard on Falco, cleaving into his right shoulder, the axe blade digging deep, hitting the bone of his clavicle as the sound of breaking bones was heard. Pain shot down throughout his body, and Falco, screaming in pain, the light of the day quickly faded, and darkness fell over Falco's eyes as he began to lose all consciousness. But, as he started to fade further into the darkness of his mind, he heard the battle cry of another man, and the brief wisp of sound of a passing arrow, and the southern male screaming in pain himself, and before Falco heard no more, he felt a thud hit the ground next to him. Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 2 The pain was unbearable. At first, Falco felt his shoulder, as if the sharp knife was constantly digging in to the bone, but without relieving. 
Then, he felt the stabbing, burning pain wave throughout his abdomen. Blurried, Falco opened his eyes and took in a deep gas of breath, but stopping short of a full intake of air into his lungs as the pain in his abdomen intensified and his vision again began to fade. Whoa, whoa there, my little friend. A male voice Falco heard now from behind him. Relax. Don't breathe in too deeply, nor move too much. You need to rest. You're safe now. Falco briefly looked around, and his vision still blurry, saw the image of a man with dark clothing walking over to him. The pain spiked again, and clutching his stomach, Falco fell again into unconsciousness. Falco felt his entire body was moving, rocking in fact, from side to side. As he slowly opened his eyes, they began to pain again like they had in the tunnel of the nameless thing, but this time it wasn't torchlight, but the bright light of the midday sun. Falco tried to move, but he seemed to be bound to something. What was it, he thought? His eyes adjusted to the daylight, and panning around, he was tied to some form of stretcher, and was being dragged along the ground. He tried to look behind him, but the pain in both his stomach and shoulder made it unbearable. Clenching his teeth, he relaxed and listened and heard the methodic trotting of a four-legged animal and the occasional sound of neighing. Where? Where are you taking me? Falco said aloud, as much as the pain led him. The horse stopped trotting, and Falco heard behind him someone dismounting, cloak being tucked behind, and a shadow of a man came over Falco's vision. To Bree, my young friend, you are no sheep to get there yourself, said the man now standing in clear view in front of Falco. Before him stood a man of the wild, or so he thought, based on his garments. A dark green hood shaded his face from the complete view, a long cloak wrapped around his shoulders, and he wore a leather shirt and well-seasoned leggings and boots. A sword hung from a sheath off to his belt to the left side, and a large bow was slung across his back. He stood with careful awareness of his surroundings, and a confidence in his abilities alone out in the wild. Falco knew him as a ranger of the north, and a smile came across his face as he knew he was in good hands. What? What happened? Last I remembered, I was ambushed by a lone farmhouse. Falco now again feeling the pain of his wounds, closed his eyes and took some short, quick breaths, but remained conscious. Yes, you were. And if it weren't for me happening in your battle with those raiders of the south, you would most assuredly have not woken up again. The ranger responded to Falco. Thank you. Again, thank you. I do not know your name, but I recognize you as one of the ranger's folk. Falco said laboriously, resting his head now against the stretcher. Falco looked, looked about him, and seeing what happened would appear to be old poles from the farm tools, tied in some fashion to a wool blanket to make some sort of stretcher. The ranger pulled back his dark hood. His face was fair, but weathered, as if it had already spent many years out in the wild. His hair, dark, long, and unkept. Ranger of the North for sure, as Falco had seen many during his early life in Bree, when he would spend time at the Prancing Pony, or in the Green during the time of the markets. Those that know me other than Ranger, call me Terzdan. And shall I have the name of my informed Breelander, Terzdan, now bending down to come closer to Falco. Falco coughed and let out a muffled groan of pain. Falco, uh, Falco Hornblower at your service. Pleasure to meet you, Falco Hornblower. Come now, close your eyes and rest. We are still a good two or three days from Bree, and these roads are not as safe as they once were in the day, let alone at night, as you can attest. Terzdan now checking the bandages to Falco's shoulder and abdomen, and ensuring he was secure to the stretcher as one could be. Falco nodded, groaned, and then closed his eyes. Again, Falco groaned at the sudden lurching of the rope that was tied to the saddle of Terzdan's horse, as it became taut, and he was pulled forward. Falco kept it quiet as possible. He wanted as much to be back in Bree as Terzdan wanted to get him there, and so didn't want to stop the way back for any reason unless absolutely necessary. A number of hours passed and Falco felt the sudden stop of the horse, and the relaxing of the stretcher to the ground, as Terzdan untied it and laid it as gently as possible in the grass. We will camp here the evening and night. You are a tough one, Falco, I'll give you that. But if you need me to stop because of the pain, please speak up. A few minutes of rest will not delay us too much. Now, let me get a fire started, and I'll set a place for you to rest. 
A half hour had passed, and Terzdan returned. I've made his bed as best I could for you to rest tonight. Let's get over there, and I'll help you move out and over to it. Falco, taking a deep breath as possible, nodded to Terzdan to proceed. Terzdan pulled Falco down into a small depression, a large oak with its overhanging branches and leaves, and its large, old roots stretching out and creating a very welcoming camp. The sun was low in the sky, the tree and the dip in the ground now helping the sun cast a shadow into the camp, the light of the small fire now providing more illumination. Terzdan nodded to Falco, and with a quick jerk of the stretcher pulled him into a, a now surprisingly comfortable bed of branches, heavy moss, and bundled tall grasses. Burzan unsecured Falco from the stretcher, and for the first time in hours, Falco was able to, although limited by the waves of intense pain, move his limbs freely. This, this is surprisingly comfortable. I'm sure the prancing pony doesn't have as good a bed as this. Falco, half chuckled, but then winced in the pain as his abdomen sharply ached again. I've had a bit of practice out here in the wilds, and spent one too many nights sleeping on hard rock or a knotty branch of an oak. You won't find a more comfortable bed out here than right here. Rest now. I'll go get us some food. We shouldn't expect any danger tonight. This area is well off the main road and very few know of its place, save for the rangers, of course. I've set your belongings next to you, here, and I won't be long. With that, Terzan quickly disappeared into the wooded area. Falco now found himself, save for Terzan Hor, alone once again. Well, my four-legged friend, how are you this evening? Falco said to Terzan's horse. The horse neighed and nodded his head up and down. That is good. I'm glad you're here. Falco rested his head and closed his eyes, seeing now images of Bree, his home in the hill, and Billy his pony, peacefully grazing along the pathway. I'll soon be home, my friend. Four days had passed since the battle at the lone farmhouse along the greenway, north of Bree, before the circular-shaped hedge and the hill of Bree came into view as Falco, still on the stretcher, and Terzdan, guiding his horse, stopped on a small ridge overlooking the valley. Terzdan dismounted, and relaxing the tension on the stretcher, helped Falco up and onto his feet. Falco grimaced in pain as he stood now, overlooking the valley. Bree and Bree Hill clearly in view, the midday sun shining brightly down upon it. This is where we part ways, Falco. Sorry I can't bring you any further. I have matters to attend to further north from where I found you, Terzdan reluctantly saying. We will meet again, I am sure, Falco, and if you ever do need help again, I do frequent the pony when I'm down this way. Who knows? Maybe I'll accompany you back into the Shire, as I wouldn't mind some of the peace I've heard exist there. Although, if it is true what you have told me these past days, then there's more to the Shire than meets the eye. With that, Terzan turned, mounting the horse, he gave Falco a nod, fixed his hood over his head, and rode off into the north. Falco coughed and watched until Terzan was out of sight, turning ever so gently to face the valley below, his homeland in clear view. Falco smiled and shuffled down, bracing himself with his trusty spear. Falco reached the outer north gate of the hedge wall. As he approached, he was met by one of the watchmen now running towards him. Aye, lad, what happened to ye? The watchman excitedly speaking aloud to Falco. Oh, just a casual chat with some southerners to the north. Falco smiled, chuckled, but then coughing due to the vein he now experienced, coursing through his shoulders and abdomen. Ha! Casual! Southerners, you say? Foul lot they be, and it seems to be more common than not nowadays. Here, let me help you along. Mr. The watchman now helping Fro Falco pass the open gates. Falco, hornblower of Bree Hill, proudly Falco responded. Falco it is. Well I met, good sir. Glad you made it home safely. Looks like you need the rest. I'll see about getting you up there in due course. If you want to wait a bit, I'll bring you myself, once I find someone to cover the gate here. The watchman ushered him into the small shack, where the men, who's on watch, sit during bad weather, eat their meals, and take a quick nap when no one is looking. An hour passed and the watchman's replace arrived, and Falco lifted himself with the help of the watchman into the bed of a small cart. Falco rested himself on the side wall of the cart, 
and smiled as he looked about the town of Bree. He didn't realize until now how much he had missed the comfort sights and sounds of Bree since he little under two months ago. Passing the lower slopes of Bree Hill, stone houses, blacksmith's workshops, tailors, leather workers, and all other manners of tradesmen were busy about their business, taking no mind of Falco, and he was glad. He knew most of the people here, growing up, of course, just on the hill above, running errands for his father and grandfather, and helping out, of course, with some of those, when he needed some extra coin as a young tween. Rounding one of the switchbacks as the path would wound its way up the hill, Falco looked down at an activity in the quarry. Still amazed him in the amount of rock Breelanders have cut out of there all these generations. Now a bit of ways up and round the upper hillside, Newtown, most of Bree calls it. Although Falco found this funny considering his family has been traced to be living here, much like the rest of the Bree hobbits, for nigh 1,000 years or more. So new, it is not. Here, my place is here, Falco said to the watchman, pulling up to the well-worn and weather stone path. Not much had changed since Falco left. The home he's known that the Hornblower family of Bree have lived in was nondescript as most of the homes on the hill, and unlike the smells of the Shire, the Hobbit Breelanders, much like the big folk below, have built homes of stone and wood. Low, one-story buildings with square doors instead of the round ones Falco noticed in the Shire. What was common, however, was the love of things that grow, and all the homes were fronted with colorful, fenced gardens. I am indebted for your help. I thank you. Falco hobbled up to the watchman, now looking down at him even more than before. Falco nodded and shook his outstretched hand. When I'm further on the mint, I'll drop by and say hello. Anything that you're in need, over that I might be able to help with? The watchman chuckled and smiled. Don't think anything of it. Aye, if a Breelander can't help another Breelander get home, what are we doing here? Falco smiled. Fair enough. I think of something to express my gratitude. Stay safe, my friend. Falco turned around to face his family home. The garden was in full bloom, with a wide array of car carefully planted flowers, reds, purples, yellows, and whites. And then, Falco's heart gleamed as he heard from behind the house on the slope of the hill the neighing of a pony, and not just any pony, but Billy, his trusted friend and companion. Falco hobbled his way as fast as he could muster. Whatever pain he was experiencing, he didn't notice. And as he rounded the back of the corner of the house, there was Billy, staring at him, nodding and neighing, and trying to greet him. My good friend, so have I missed you. Falco now giving Billy a hug, brush, and a touching of the head with his. What is all this commotion out here? The voice of a female hobbit, now echoing from inside the house. Opening the back porch, Falco's mother, Miss Hannah Hornblower, by the word, is that really you, Falco? She exclaimed, now running and pulling Falco around and giving him the biggest hug. Falco winced in pain, groaned, and let out a couple of hurting coughs. What on earth happened to you? See, I told your father you shouldn't have pulled you back when you left. Now look at you. Now you come inside and tell me what happened. You best not be going out again, I tell you that. Shaking Falco and releasing him, he turned around and proceeded back inside. Falco now, half unconscious from the resulting influx of pain, rested up against Billy. I think I would have chanced a night with a nameless thing again, Billy, than to have to come home back here like this. Although he had no idea what Falco was talking about, Billy neighed in agreement. Book 2, Chapter 4 Four weeks had passed since Falco returned to his family's home in Bree Hill, severely injured during the ambush of the southerners somewhere north of Bree along the Greenway. Falco's time spent in the comfort of his own room and bed, sitting out in the back garden with Billy and eating the hearty food cooked by his mother, seemed to have brightened his spirits and sped up the healing of his wounds. Fortunately for Falco, the piercing of the spear into his abdomen hadn't nicked any vital organs and had for the most part healed nicely. He would still keep light to his duties so as not to further delay the healing. His shoulder was much the same, and placing it in a sling for most of the past month helped to strengthen it to an almost perfect form and function. Now the careful work of building his strength, chopping wood, stacking wood, 
and other chores around the home. He pondered his time away from Bree, now three months gone. Thoughts of Bag End, Bilbo, of the Woody End, of Bamfurlong, and the events at the ferry and of the Old Wood, and of course Barilac. He wanted to put into song his experience and all his short companionship with Barilac, but he had yet to find the words. Was the events too fresh in his mind, he thought, or maybe it was something else. For although his home was as colorful and vibrant as it always was, the food tasteful and delicious, something was off. The colors seemed duller, the flowers less vibrant, the smell of the grasses ever so fainter. The darkness of the night seemed to shade the stars more, and the candlelight shone less. His dreams were drearier, and although he did sleep well, he felt the weariness always tugging at his mind. What was it about the ring that caused this so? It was just a ring after all, wasn't it? Had that creature deep in the tunnels below the hills soured the very metal? Falco couldn't be for sure, but now it was time to find out. But how and where? The ring was finely crafted piece of jewelry, nothing he'd seen nor his family would have ever seen. He kept it off his finger and into his pocket since he's been home to ensure his father, less his mother, asked too many questions of what happened while he was gone. For their part, all he's let on was the journeys within the Shire the people and the places he's seen, especially Barilac and Bilbo Baggins. He explained that he and Billy got separated in a deep fog, and then he was ambushed by Southerners on his return home. That seemed to have quelled their suspicions, for now. Falco, during his first days at home, wrote a letter to Bilbo, and had been able to secure a prompt delivery to the Shire shortly thereafter. Greetings, Bilbo. I know I had said I would return to your fine home at Bag End prior to me leaving the Shire one day. However, fate it would have seemed was not in my favor in doing so. As you've probably already seen from the envelope, I am currently in Bree. But I assure you that I was not my plan, as I would most certainly would have liked to have smoked some nice old Toby with my new Rosefields pipe overlooking the valley from your front door. I am still forever grateful for your hospitality and kindness you had shown me. I could go on and lengthy chat with you about my experiences since leaving you and Farmer Maggot at Bamford alone, but as it would seem, most of the Shire was quite well aware of my dealings with the burnt piece. I'm sure you must have heard about it by now, but what you probably didn't hear was how Bearlock and I met one Tom Bombadil and his fair and soft-spoken wife, Lady Goldberry. What a peculiar couple one should meet in the darkness and shade of the old forest, but there they were, cheerful in song, always. Have you had a chance to meet them in your journeys, Bilbo? I know you hadn't met him, but Berlak was an honorable hobbit. After he had died combating those dreadful beasts in the thicket of the old forest, I took care of his affairs. Woodhall for a month was the least I could do, wasn't it? If you're ever in Woodhall, pay tribute to him at the wood's end. His axe is hung behind the bar and he placed his save for him there forever. I've taken his hunting knife as a personal remembrance and it's done me well so far. Oh, you'll like this. On a rumor, I decided to head north to the Greenfields. As you're probably already aware, that's where the Battle of the Goblins occurred, and one bull roar took save the Shire. Apparently, some hunters have been picking up some treasures up that way, so I figured I'd have a look. Unfortunately, I never did make it, as something was amiss in the Brockenbore's minds, and I don't know what came over me. Maybe it was Barilac's willing spirit to see it to things are made right, but I agreed to investigate and take a look. Besides the unusual mushrooms down there, yes, mushrooms, miners opened up a cavern which held something very sinister, but also rewarding. A creature slumbered there, a creature I don't know with a name, but its visage still haunts my thoughts to this very day. It's a good thing I had my wits about me, and my leather shirt was hardened, as I was able to escape. But before I left, I found something, Bilbo, a ring, a silver ring of very fine craftsmanship. I have no idea who forged such a thing as this, but it's nothing that I've ever seen. I don't know how much you know about rings, but this ring, when I did find it, it felt dark. It did seem tainted, and I haven't been able to shake it off that feeling ever since I took it. Maybe it was the years stuck in close proximity to that horrid creature. I don't know. But whatever it is, even if I remove the ring from my finger and lay it somewhere else, even leave the room, the ever-presence of darkness still grabs around my very being. Do you know where I can learn more about it? I've heard old Oswald Brecker here in Combe 
has some old tomes from long ago, but he's a cantankerous old soul and I wish not to ask of him. Considering your many travels, maybe you can point me in the right direction. I would very much appreciate it, and if there's anything I can do for you in return, by all means ask of it. I patiently await your response. Yours in adventure, Falco. Falco had checked the mailbox frequently, and although no letter had yet arrived, he was still hopeful that Bilbo had received the letter. One evening, finally feeling the will and energy too, Falco made his way to the Prancing Pony, now into the later part of the second month of his return to Bree, and the warmth of the summer had faded, and the cool, crisp air of autumn was approaching. Falco walked full of vigor into the pony. As always, the main hall was filled with all sorts of Greenlanders, dwarves from the Blue Mountains, and of those past the Misty Mountains. A ranger sat alone in a small alcove on the far side, and surprisingly a group of Shire Hobbits. On a trade's trip, Falco guessed, the swapping of stories, clanking of tankards, and the singing of song was lively as it always was at the pony. Barnabas Butterbur was busy attending to the patrons when he spotted Falco entering through the main doors. Ah, Mr. Hornblower, so great to see you. It's been a while. What shall I get you? Falco was always amazed that Barnabas remembered who he was, but it would appear that Barnabas had an uncanny memory for such things. The house I owe, Mr. Butterbur. Falco shouted over the noise. The best! Great choice! Coming right up, my young friend. Barnabas quickly turned and headed over to the spigot that was now quite wet from the flowing of ale from the evening's festivities. Falco stood, waiting for his half pint, when he felt a tapping on his shoulder. Turning around, he saw a well-dressed hobbit standing before him. Did I hear the keeper earlier call you Mr. Hornblower? He asked inquisitively. Falco nodded yes. And by chance, are you one Falco Hornblower? Again, Falco nodded. The hobbit shifted his stance and again asked the Falco. And what's the finest weed to come out of the South Farthing? Falco paused, and with a curious look responded, Well, old Toby, of course. The hobbit smiled and reaching into his waistcoat inner pocket, pulled out an envelope, Falco noticing the same wax seal from Bag End as the letter he had delivered to Bam for, for a, long, a month earlier. Well then, Mr. Falco, I believe this is for you. Handing over the letter to Falco, the hobbit bid him to have a good evening and return to his traveling companions in the Shire. Falco heard the sound of a mug hitting the wood counter. Ah, here you go, Mr. Hornblower. Oh, I see you have a letter. By gracious, I had forgotten by the time you walked in. Yes, those hobbits over there were asking and looking for you. And well, it looks like they found you without me having to tell you. What a busy night this has been, good gracious me. And off he chuckled to help another customer. Falco grabbed his mug and looking around, found himself a relatively quiet table off to the side. Taking a swallow of ale, he opened the envelope. Inside was a letter from Bilbo, and another envelope, sealed and marked in some form of what looked like Alvin's script. Falco set the closed envelope down on the table and proceeded to read the letter. My adventurous Falco. It is good to finally hear from you, and not from rumors and tales from passing bucklers and noisy brace girdles. I am a little disappointed that I didn't get a chance to meet with you in person, for you have a tale of adventure that would have paired well with a fine drink of wine and some smoke ring blowing outside. Regardless, next time you are around, I would very much like to take some notes from my journal. It would make for an excellent entry into it. Now, as fate would have it, I believe I can help you out, and in turn, you can help me out as well. As you can see, I've enclosed another letter. Sealed, of course. And you've probably all already wondered what's with the writing. Well, you see, that's a missive intended for the master of Rivendell, Elrond Halfell. And I needed to be delivered to him successfully. And that's where you come in, my boy. I would have done it myself, but as such a long walk that I have another matters to attend to that require my immediate attention. And well, you've certainly proved yourself capable. What, especially after what you've told me so far? You're wondering then how I, I can help you. Well, you see, that's where Master Elrond comes in. He is a wise and ancient lore, even more so than my good friend Gandalf, the Grey Wizard. I know, right? How someone can be more knowledgeable than a wizard? I have no idea. Regardless, he can definitely help you, and I'll help you get there and have an audience with him. I'm sure he will be able to answer your riddle of what appears to be a very fine ring, my young treasure hunter. 
How to get there, you're probably wondering. Well, let's have a little game of riddles, shall we? If you can successfully answer the riddle below, you'll find your way to Rivendell. If not, well, you nor I will receive what we want from this little adventure. No pressure, but I'm counting on you to deliver. Below the mist of the mountain, clouds of white touching stone, the valley lies below a river cross you go. If you figure out the answer, very good, but keep it secret. Master Alaron does not wish his home to be frequently visited, if you know what I mean. Now, that should do it. It'll be a long journey, and be careful. The road east is a perilous one. Stay on the road as much as possible, and if you're fortunate enough, find you a dwarven caravan to accompany. They'll take you part of the way. Good luck. Yours in adventure, Bilbo. Falco sat back, and laying the letter down before him, grabbed the mug of Barnabas' best, and took it in a long swig. He grabbed the unopened envelope with the elder script, and the letter from Bilbo, and shifting his eyes from one to the other, he let it a long, deep sigh. I had better not tell Mother, Falco said to himself quietly. It was another two weeks before Falco was ready, his wounds mostly if not fully healed. The wounds would never completely heal, of course. The shoulder wound now has a long scar from the axe blade, and across the midsection diagonally the wound from the tip of the spear across his abdomen. The week spent in the resting wasn't all for naught, as he honed his archery more so than he had before, this time focusing on moving and shooting while still hitting his target. Timing his departure when his parents would not be home, running their own personal errands, he left an oath saying his goodbyes, and with billing in tow, proceeded down the hill into the old town well. Filling his water skin and tossing a coin, he smiled, looked around, and with another nodding of his head, proceeded through the south gate of the hedge and onward to the great east road. <laughs>